Again, I'm Melanie Welch from ALA's Public Programs Office. Welcome to today's webinar, Teen Reading Lounge, Continuing to Engage Your Teens in a Virtual Space. Before we start, I'd like to make a few quick notes. Today's webinar is presented by ALA's Public Programs Office with funding provided by the National Endowment for the Humanities as part of the Coronavirus Aid, Relief and Economic Security Act, the CARES Act, Economic Stabilization Plan. Hopefully, many of you are familiar with Programming Librarian, a website of ALA's Public Programs Office. We have a lot of program ideas and an online learning library full of free webinars, just like this one. A couple of notes about our virtual classroom. Only our presenters have video and microphone access, but you are welcome to type your questions or comments in the chat box. To send a chat message, move your cursor to the bottom of the Zoom web window and click chat. Please note that the chat defaults to sending only to all panelists. So to make sure everyone can see your message, be sure to select all panelists and attendees in the drop down box next to the to field in chat. If you have any technical issues, please use the Q&A window to communicate with ALA staff. To send a message through the Q&A feature, move your cursor to the bottom of the Zoom window and click on Q&A. Please do not put technical questions in the chat window as they could get missed there. Now I'd like to introduce you to our topic and presenters for this afternoon. Moderating our discussion today is Dr. Valerie, I'm sorry, Dr. Valerie Adams Bass. Dr. Adams Bass is a developmental psychologist whose research focuses on how black children see themselves and related outcomes. She is an assistant professor of youth and social innovation and a fa faculty affiliate of the Youth Next Center to promote effective youth development in the School of Education and Human Development at the University of Virginia and a faculty affiliate at the Racial Empowerment Collaborative at the University of Pennsylvania's Graduate School of Education. Dr. Adams Bass regularly trains youth development professionals professionals and teachers to use culturally relevant practices when working with children and youth. Joining Dr. Adams Bass in this discussion are two panelists. Tammy Blount is a teen services librarian at the Erie County Public Library. She has over 20 years of experience in public service and education working with teens. She began her career in public libraries in 2015 and has facilitated the Teen Reading Lounge program at the library for the past five years. Aurora Sanchez is a Teen Reading Lounge facilitator at the Free Library of Philadelphia with over 15 years of experience in youth development. Through various Philadelphia nonprofits, Aurora has supported youth to build safe spaces, develop as leaders, and support change in their communities for over a decade. Aurora earned a Bachelor's of Arts in Spanish from Temple University in 2006. We are also joined today by Julia Terry, Education Program Officer at the Pennsylvania Humanities Council. Julia is the facilitator, visual artist, and an anti-racist educator and mother living in West Philadelphia. She is a Leeway Art and Change Grant recipient currently sits on the Philadelphia Commission for Women and was a cultural agent with the U.S. Department of Arts and Culture. Julia holds a BA from Hampshire College in Studio Art and Youth Development and completed her MA in Art Education at Tufts University and the School of the Museum of Fine Art. We are so thrilled to be joined by these presenters. And with that, I'm going to hand things over to Julia to tell us more about today's topic the Pennsylvania Humanities Council and their award-winning non-traditional book club, the Teen Reading Lounge. Take it away, Julia. Hi everyone, thanks Melanie. Uh, we're so excited to be here today um, and especially grateful for ALA for hosting this webinar. Um, 
in our in our webinar, we we hope to explore ways to offer humanities programs to young adults in a virtual setting, to share some repli replicable examples of library programming, and uh, help you to understand the importance of humanities programming for young adults. So. After I share a little bit more about PHA and TR, our Teen Reading Lounge program, um, we will move to a panel of, of our practitioners and then have some time to answer questions and share resources. The Pennsylvania Humanities Council is an independent nonprofit partner of the National Endowment for the Humanities and one of 56 humanities councils. We put the humanities in action to create positive change. This includes creating programs and providing grant support to organizations across the state working in education and civic engagement. My favorite definition of the humanities says that they are disciplines of memory and imagination. In our programs, a humanities-based approach might look like engaging in dialogue, sharing stories, and uncovering marginalized histories in an effort to better understand who we are, where we come from, what we value, and where we are going. Our flagship education program is, te is Teen Reading Lounge. TRL launched in 2010 in six brave libraries willing to pilot the program and has since expanded to over 80 libraries across the Commonwealth. We've engaged over a thousand young people from suburban, rural, and urban communities. What makes the program unique is that it is a youth-led book club where students create their own reading lists, lead discussions, and co-create civic engagement projects inspired by the issues and perspectives they learn through the humanities. We know the humanities are a powerful tool for building empathy and taking action. The TRL model encourages participants to recognize and understand perspectives that are different from their own by using the humanities to provide a platform for participants to connect with and understand characters as well as each other. In this time of social distancing and intersecting crises, this, uh, this time has emphasized the importance of relationships more than ever for positive youth development. Our evaluations over the last year show that even in virtual programming, TRL leaders have successfully used the humanities as a platform to engage students in conversation. With their most report, consistently reported outcome in our evaluations being that they better express their thoughts and feelings to others. You can learn more about PHC and TRL by visiting pahumanities.org. And we invite you to explore the resources on our TRL page, especially, which include our program development guide. Our program development guide. And now I'm going to pass things off to Valerie to introduce, so that our panel can get started and introduce themselves. Thank you, Julia. Thank you, Melanie. Thank you, Thanks. ALA, for having me. I am excited to be a part of this panel. Uh, again, I'm Valerie Adams Bass, and I've been also working with the Teen Reading Lounge to really consider how to put children, youth, teens at the center of programming. And PhD has really been brave and exploratory, adventurous in choosing to develop TRL into a program where youth voice is heard and elevated throughout the state of Pennsylvania. So I am very excited to hear from the, to help you hear and discuss with our two panelists, Tammy Blount and Aurora Sanchez, who represents two very different counties across the state of Pennsylvania. And as Julia mentioned, when we think of humanities and young people think of humanities, we've asked them several times, what is the humanities? And oftentimes they'll say boring museums or history, or they'll just say they don't know, just as much as when we ask adults, what does the humanities mean? So in TRL, we really begin to think about applied humanities. Over the last 10 years, going into 11 years, it has evolved how we think about humanities, how we define humanities, how we engage young people, particularly teens with humanities, has evolved to include hands-on learning, where they get to explore the history and create history in their own communities. 
And so as we hear from both Tammy and Aurora, we'll get an idea of what that means to young people and how they can embrace the humanities and particularly how they can take advantage of all the resources that libraries have to offer um, beyond just books, right? So the books are definitely attractive to the young people, but what is it about the library that goes beyond books and makes those connections to humanities? How do we learn about the history right there in our community, whether it's from 200 years ago or 25 days ago? We hear a little bit more about those things and how that looks in both um, uh, from both Tammy as well as from Aurora today and hopefully be able to do some additional contextualizing with you about what the humanities looks like when you're working with young people and certainly when you're working with young people in virtual spaces. So with that context and a little bit more about TRL and thinking broadly about the humanities, I'd like to ask if you would put into the chat box, what is your definition of humanities? When you think of humanities, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? So if you could do that, would you just drop that in the box for us? Or if there's something you've been doing that brings the humanities to life for young people, would you drop that into the chat box? Yes, history is, is often used um, and thought of when we think of the humanities, English and arts, absolutely. I see you. Thank you so much. So as you are typing that in, keep an open ear and we're going to hear from Tammy Blount next, who's going to talk to us a little bit more about what TRL looks like in her community, what her community looks like, as well as what the young people are doing in Erie County. Tammy? Hello. Um, thank you, Valerie. Um, we'll get started with the next slide, please, Phoebe. <laughs> okay. Um, as Valerie said, Aurora and I come from very different, um, distinct parts of Pennsylvania. We're on opposite corners. I'm in the western northern air corner on the um, Lake Erie on the bay. We're a mid-sized library. We have um, a main branch and four I mean, a main location and four branches and a bookmobile. Okay, next slide. Um, you learned a little bit about TRL, but um, there's basic components that are all the same or that we hope you know to aspire to, um, that it's from 12 to 18 year olds in grades seven through eight, we get a grant funding. So a lot of people say, well, how are you able to do that? we apply for a grant and we're fortunate enough to have that money and also additional funding from our friends at the library. This is the eighth year that we've had TRL because we were in a couple of the pilots. Um, and this will be the sixth year that I'm doing TRL at the Erie County Public Library. Typically when we were in person, it would run um, three to four sessions, each being six to eight meetings uh, for two hours, if sometimes longer. Um, because the teens, they engage and they enjoy the program so much. A lot of times people ask, how do you keep teens there for that long? They will stay until the library closes. So they can't stay any longer because I always schedule it right at 6 to 8, 30 when the library closes. Um, why? I think one of the biggest components is that they have all of the control, most of it. Um, they get to pick the books, decide on the discussions, so it's applicable to what they're experiencing and where they are, um, what their lives are about. So they get to share that and learn about things that they wanna learn about. Um, next slide, please. So as I said, they get to choose the books and the guests. And when we were in person, it was, um, it was a very frenetic, fast paced thing because once they chose the books, I'd have to order them so that they could get them. Um, you know, get them in and they get to keep them. But depending on how the conversations would go would kind of lead and direct who we'd bring in. Um, so I could have some things sort of planned if I had an artist who does silks, um, screen printing, then I know that, hey, we're gonna bring this in, this person in, but then they would create their own patterns and they'd learn how to do it. And so it would always fit and kind of circle back to what we were working on. Um, We've gone on trips, we've had, um, we went on one of our flagships and to an escape room. So it's really just directed on how kind of the, the conversation goes. We also have the component of the community activity or um, 
community-based projects. So in the past, they've done blessing bags for the homeless. And last year, well, this summer, we did a teen chalk display. Um, Pre-COVID, so it's really just about the culture of TRL and building trust and having the teens build trust with one another and with the facilitator. We were fortunate enough to open a teen space last year um, that's a dedicated teen space and it has very comfy chairs and lots of um, places for them to be able to socialize and get together and it just really lends itself to having those deep conversations and building trust and um, having relationships. Now we're on computers and we're doing Zoom. Um, the If you're looking at the pre-COVID, post-COVID screens, the conversations pre-COVID were very thoughtful and could be very intense. Now that we are on um, Zoom, and these are the teens' words because I asked them, I said, I'm going to tell people about TRL. What do you want to tell them now that we're um, on Zoom? And it's just awkward transitions, knowing when, if someone's like, has something that they want to say, am I going to step over them? There's a lot of, oh, no, no, you go next. And um, so that can be kind of awkward. Also, we have such a cozy space and they say it's like going to someone's friend's house and hanging out in their living room. Now they think it's a very sterile environment. It's like going to class. So it kind of um, changes the culture of how they experience and are able to share in those conversations. Uh, we have found that one app that I would recommend, um, Book Clubs with a Z, and that has allowed us to keep everything in one place. So I can post discussion questions, they can respond and put their art up or things that they're working on. Um, we have a record of all the books that we've read and it will also invite, like you can copy your Zoom um, invite and it'll send out reminders. So that's been very, um, successful. We now have to get the materials to the teens. So um, we put together book boxes and these have been very popular with the younger kids, but even with the teens, um, everyone likes to get a present in the middle of the year for no reason. So they have the books and related um, materials and extra snacks and stickers and the things that normally they would have um, that we can't be sure that they have. So I'll put extra supplies and art things, you know, because I don't know what we're necessarily going to do, but we work it the same way where, well, we have these materials, what would you like to do with them? Okay, Bibi. Um, so the one thing that I'd like to talk about that has been super successful and the teens can't stop talking about was when we had the lockdown, it was right before they were supposed to go to Pittsburgh. Um, it was a really big event. It was the biggest event that we planned with TRL, uh, getting the bus together. We had, I think about 15 teens that were gonna go to Pittsburgh for the day for the um, Bookish in the Berg, which is a YA book conference put on by the teen um, advisory board down there in Pittsburgh. So that was canceled. There was a lot of disappointments. Everyone knows I don't have to go into the sudden impact of the lockdown, but we continued on Zoom and we needed to put together a project. They knew that, you know, that was gonna be something big that they wanted to do. It was kind of a um, natural progression of how we came up with the chalk walk. We were having um, a lot of protests in our town as nationally everywhere people were having protests, but. Ours had got, um, escalated and there were riots with the storefronts being broken and um, there was just a lot of dangerous act things that were happening and the teens were frightened by that. One of the things that happened was a local group put a chalk mural outside of our um, city hall and it was regarding defunding the police. Um, it was not anything obnoxious. I mean, I don't think so, but people reacted. And before it was even up 12 hours, the next morning, the mayor had it removed with, you know, power washing and all kinds of things. And it, it caused a lot of uproar in the community, but especially with the teens, they um, were very, they reacted very strongly about how could this happen and why can't we talk? And um, so that lended itself to 
well, what does free speech mean and how can we express ourselves and how can we get involved, but most especially, how can you do it safely? Um, they came up with the chalk walk because they really wanted to be in person and we were not having in-person programming, um, but we said, well, we can plan it and see if it works and we'll try it out. So what happened was we had an all day event. Um, most of the marketing and um, program flyers were created by the teens and we were on the news a lot, but that was another opportunity for the teens to talk about why they were doing this and um, how the event went. It was super successful. They really can't wait to do it again um, next year. And hopefully it'll be an annual event. We'll have different themes. But it, as you can see with the art there um, on the top picture, that teen was expressing how um, the, the picture of the boy, the person on the, on the right was struggling with feeling alone and isolated and having all these fears and concerns and she wanted to show that there were all these different hands of different people who were lending a hand to help. Um, the art that they came up was just magical and the messages that they expressed, as you see in the bottom one, that everyone, um, when they stand up and she wanted to use uh, people, use the flags, all the different um, LGBTQTA flags in the, um, art of the people. So they were really thought, thoughtful about what they were expressing. Um, the art's still there. And I can see the sidewalk behind the library from my um, from the teen space. It's a very popular place, but there are people stopping now still and looking at the art. So their message has continued to spread throughout the community. Um, and that's given them a lot of hope. I don't know if I have another slide. Nope. So I will thank you for your time and I look forward to answering questions and sharing more about TRL. Um, and I will turn it over to Aurora. Hello. Ah, so pleased to be here with you all. BB, next slide, please. So I am a facilitator for the Teen Reading Lounge, which is a unique position in the sense that even though I work for the Free Library of Philadelphia, um, I am not a librarian. And I am actually only in this library when we are facilitating programs. So a little bit about Lucian E. Blackwell Library, um, which is one of the TRL sites that I facilitate. It is located in West Philadelphia, just two blocks away from the L. Um, it's on 52nd Street. 52nd Street is a major hub of like businesses, businesses and like carts on streets, um, lots of food. Um, there's a McDonald's, just a little bit of everything, right? Like informal clothing shops, sneaker shops, a little bit of everything is happening in West Philadelphia on, um, on 52nd Street. Um, so this branch opened up in the 1970s and it's the second regional library in the system of the Free Library of Philadelphia. The system currently consists of 54 libraries. Um, the city itself has over one and a half million people. Um, and the library is named after a politician and activist um, from West Philadelphia, Lucian E. Blackwell. Um, a little bit about what you see in this picture. So this is a mural um, and the name of the mural in the photo is uh, Legacy. And I believe this mural is about two years old. Uh, we have a program in the city of Philadelphia, the Mural Arts Program. It's an amazing program that works with all different kinds of folks, all ages, demographics, backgrounds um, to bring arts and culture into the city um, and to involve the communities in that. Um, and so some of the things that they've been really wonderful about is really engaging the local community. This particular piece was done by, and I'm going to like cheat now, here we go, uh, the artist Wale Oyedije um, and Ikire Jones were the two artists that were primarily working on this. They collaborated with young people from the mural arts program. And the theme behind this is how to create your own culture. Um, so it's a lens on global inclusivity and the stories of the African immigrants that are in West Philadelphia. Both of those artists are known um, for incorporating African culture, African fabric, African textures um, into their works. And another thing about that particular neighborhood is it, and that particular street, um, it was the site of unrest after the police killing of Walter Wallace Jr. Um, so it's that much of a hub. Walter Wallace Jr. 
um, was killed near his home, um, some blocks away from that, but in that neighborhood. Um, and when folks took to the street, 52nd Street is one of the streets that folks took to. Um, so this is a neighborhood that is um, very culturally rich. Um, a lot of times people will speak of the, the poverty levels. It's an 80%, over 80% Black neighborhood, whereas the city of Philadelphia is about 40% Black, 40% White. Um, this neighborhood is is you know also known for having the house of Paul Robeson, um, having its own like small cultural institutions. So, uh, next slide, please. So Teen Reading Lounge at Blackwell. Um, so we began in spring of 2018. Um, I've been working for the Free Library since probably like 2004, 2005. I started as a work study student. I began working with teens almost exclusively in 2006. Uh, I was hired to work the Teen Tuesday program at the main library downtown. And so when this program opportunity came up, um, the one of the administrators from the library at Blackwell reached out to me to ask if I wanted to facilitate this program and I was absolutely thrilled to do it. Um, and so we do about two sessions a year six to eight weeks per session. Uh, we only fill it, we only have hosted programs on weekdays. We did do one session that was like twice a month um, for one month at the suggestion of one of our young people it was actually incredibly successful. It was just a one-time thing that we tried though. Our students tend to be older middle school and younger high school students. That's a sweet spot for me. I love that age group. Um, they're still very engaged. They're still very curious. They are still slightly less inhibited than their older peers. Um, and as far as recruitment, we typically recruit young people like literally in the libraries. Um, again, so I don't work at this library on a regular basis. I have gone around to community organizations and local schools to hand out flyers. Um, but I also really rely on the librarian that I work with. Her name is Stacy Wyatt. Um, and she says that I bring the magic and she brings the rubber bands. Uh, that's kind of her description for, for how we work together. Um, and it's actually really Really wonderful and she's incredibly supportive. Um, as you can see or as you may perceive, I am a woman of African descent um, and Stacy is not. Um, Stacy is a white woman my age and she's from the whole, uh, like she's from Seattle, West Coast, right? Um, and so we bring a, we bring very different vibes. She's a librarian, I'm not a librarian, just totally different vibe. Um, but we, we, we do good work and we have a good time together um, and we love our young people. And it, what's nice is that she's always there, right? So she's able to continue building that relationship and continue like, you know, working with them. But I'm only with them when we're in session. Um, I'm trying to think what else, what else, what else, what else? Oh, so the work that they've done, what we've done. Um, so just recently, um, last year, this time, we went to go see Harriet because they were incredibly excited about seeing Harriet. Hamilton was a big deal at that time. So we were like dabbling in some Hamilton graphic novel, dabbling in some like Hamilton Eliza love story, uh, which was very uncharacteristic for us. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. We visited the Museum of the American Revolution during that time. Um, they've made two videos about street harassment over the course of my time with them. Um, and which is funny because none of our work has been about street harassment that was just what they wanted to do they've also made a video about bullying a video about sexting um, and we worked with a local organization a local film organization um we brought them in to do that work with them. They've created social media content. Um, we were fortunate enough to have an author visit early on and we visited Eastern State Penitentiary, which is exactly what it sounds like, uh, except that it's a museum now. And it was, um, even in its inception as a penitentiary, it was designed to be about reform and prison reform. And now that it's a museum and also a haunted house around Halloween, um, it, they have continued that legacy. Um, so when we went to go visit Eastern State Penitentiary, they had an amazing exhibit about prison reform and just education on crime um, and, and, and the difference between like being caught committing a crime and not being caught committing a crime and, and uh, million dollar blocks that are targeted um, for, are, where folks are targeted for arrest. So yeah, just a lot of exploration and a lot of learning we've been doing together. Next slide, please. Okay, so then and now. You can see for yourself um, how things have shifted just at a first glance, right? So when we were when we do this in real life, young people sign up in person live at the library. Um, this time around, we had a Google form that we you know sent a link out via Instagram, sent a link out via Facebook, 
and we got 43 young people signed up compared to 11 young people who signed up in real life. 15 of those young people participated. Again, even though that's less than half of the number that registered, that's still higher than the number of young people um, that we saw last year at that time. Um, we had a bunch of regular, we have a good chunk of regulars every time, which is, you know, heartwarming. That means that they love us enough to come back and they enjoy it enough to come back. Um, solid number of regulars and we also, again, we saw a jump in the number of young people um, averaging each meeting. We facilitated the meetings via Zoom. I chose Zoom or we chose Zoom. Uh, when it was time for us to kind of figure out what to do, we had no idea what platform or what time would be best. So I literally just texted the young people. Um, when we were in real life, uh, one of the things that they write down on the registration form is their phone number. And so one of the things that I do is I text them to remind them to come to meetings and I check in on them. Um, and I checked in on them after, you know, after what happened with Walter Wallace. These are young people who live in that neighborhood. I checked in on them to see how they were doing and they were all safe, but also afraid, right? They were, they were safe, but they were scared. Um, and they were having different types of interactions. One of the young people was talking about how there had been like fires um, fires and, and businesses being burned um, near them. Another young person said that they were outside the city as they were locking the city down and just kind of just made it back in time. And so um, this neighborhood and these young people in particular um, have been through a lot in just the last few months. Next slide, please. So, um, I feel like Valerie is always like, yes, but how are the young people leading? But how are the young people leading? And I am not always great at answering that question, but I love this question because there are things that I do in my job that I don't always think of. Um, and I'm always trying to do things better, but it was good that we had a chance to kind of check in the other day and kind of name a few things, right? So the young people select the books. Um, what books they choose from, it varies from it varies from session to session. But for the most part, I'm looking for like newer books um, by people of color, about people of color. Um, and I try to get that range as wide as possible. So when they're selecting, they're selecting from a wide range of people of color identities, Afrofuturistic, um, you know, Asian, uh, lesbian, like we're all over the place. We love our, we, we love to bring it all into the space. Um, and all into conversation. And there was a time when we gave out like, I don't know, probably like a half a dozen books to every young person because they were all interested in all kinds of things. So we we love that. They create community agreements. So one of the first things we do when we meet in person um, is just kind of figure out what we need to do and what we need to create to work well together. They also bring people, right? Like they do the recruitment and, and bringing of people into the space. One of the ways that they lead which is informal, but still incredibly meaningful is by like sharing their experiences. You know, when we did that video about sexting, one of the young women in the program had had a negative experience with being exposed um, through sexting. And while, you know, you might have lots of feelings about that, that's also really normal behavior for a young person. I'm going to wrap it up now. Um, I'll, let me, I'll just finish this slide really quickly. So they, when we're in person, they provide reflections. Um, at every meeting. So they're scoring the meetings. They're telling us what they liked, what they didn't like. Um, and they always decide where we go in the end, right? So how do we draw on what we've been learning, what we've been discussing, um, and their interest to create something, something different. They stay in touch. A lot of times they're really good about communicating when they're going to arrive, when they're not going to arrive, what's going on with them. Um, and they help me with setup and breakdown. So that's, that's a good chunk of like what we got going on here. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Aurora. And thank you also, uh, Tammy. I think you all did a great job of really giving some descriptive details about your program. So I just want to, I think we're going to uh, see if there are any questions. But before we do that, I just want to give a little bit more context to TRL. I'm, I'm paying attention to the chat. And hey, TRL family, it's good to see you. PHC, it's good to see you. Um, as we learn about both Erie County and Philadelphia County, Philadelphia City is a county, I want to talk a little bit more about the details of TRL that we haven't talked about. So TRL started out serving mostly suburban white youth in Pennsylvania. But one thing that was unique about PHC is that they've consistently done evaluation of the programs. And coming on board to serve as a consultant, I said, let's see who we're serving and how, how well we're serving them. And what we found is that all young people were benefiting from TRL, but young people of color, Black young people, Latino young people, Asian young people, immigrant youth, 
who are benefiting significantly more than white youth. And so TRL about three, almost four years ago, made a conscious decision to turn the program towards civic engagement, social justice, and community engagement with young people, to turn the program toward a more youth-driven, youth youth decision-making program, and to work with, Tammy mentioned pilots, to work with libraries who are willing to open the doors and intentionally recruit young people to programming that ordinarily might come in, do their homework, might hang out because it's a safe space, but go home, as well as those young people who wouldn't come there. So one of the things that we've been talking about is while it certainly has changed the warmth of TRL, both of our sites here have been, and maybe they can talk a little bit about that, have been able to recruit and attract young people who ordinarily would not be able to engage in TRL because they had something else to do or they just couldn't make it because of transportation issues. So um, I just wanna ask, I'm gonna go head back to Tammy, give Aurora a chance to catch her breath. Tammy, if you could just talk a little bit about how you are reaching young people who may not have been coming into library or hanging into TRL, and then specifically in this virtual space, what does it look like to connect with young people who would not have been part of TRL? Um, well, beginning, I have to think about, I guess um, we've been fortunate enough as I said, we created our new teen space. So that has really brought a lot more foot traffic into the library. And I've been able to meet um, a lot of teens that might just be stopping in there after lunch for something, you know, after school um, and wouldn't normally stay there. If I can see them and talk to them, um, I usually bribe them with something, you know, get a, some sort of trust going and then tell them about our programs and they're like, you do this, you do that. You know, I can't believe that that's going on at the library. And then the, also the teens that are there will invite them in. Um, now that we've gone virtual, we have the opportunity to um, put information out there to different schools that aren't usually even coming to the library or it's not on their radar. So hopefully um, with that outreach and some fun unboxing videos that we're doing and they realize that they can um, get some stuff, I think that we'll be able to build a, a bigger um, attendee list. Great, thank you team. Aurora, I know that you said you're only in the library at a limited time and you, you partner because that's the other thing. TRL is usually a librarian and a facilitator. And a facilitator is usually someone who knows the community, who's used to working with the community. We have some unique cases as in with Tammy where she is both, but most of our TRL sites have a facilitator and a librarian who work hand in hand. So Aurora, can you talk about what it's like during this virtual space to work with those young people who may not have been involved in TRL when we were brick and mortar face to face? Yes. So I guess what stands out to me, and I'm, I'm really glad that Tammy spoke about this. Um, there is an awkwardness. There's a, there's a different energy um, that needs to be conveyed and, and carried in programming now. And it's not the same as when somebody's in person and, and you're laughing and you're joking and you're playing in those same kind of ways and you're having those informal moments of just being in space together while you're setting up or while you're eating. Um, and so a part of what happens, part of what has to happen now is just a lot of personal invitation into conversation. Um, I think that's that that personal touch of like inviting people into the conversation, being that much more encouraging um, in the space to support people and 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 being willing to maybe ask more questions than you normally would. Um, it's 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 a whole other a whole other ball game. Um, and you, the other thing to remember is that I'm facilitating this for another library where I never met any of those young people in person. Um, so I've only ever met any of those young people online and the demographics for that library is also really different. And so part of it too is leaning into the young people. Um, I do this thing sometimes called ask and tell uh, where it's an invitation for them to ask a question or tell us something about whatever it is that's going on in their world. Thank you, I appreciate you both sharing that. 
And, you know, again, really focusing on, I know Aurora, you talked a little bit about your site being in a neighborhood that's densely populated by African-American high poverty levels. Um, thinking about the patrons that come into your libraries, thinking about the, the diversity in your community, Tammy, um, would you just talk a little bit about what it's like to have that comfy team space and have other people. I know oftentimes when I do professional development, I'll say, what, what's the first thing that comes to your mind when you see, say, teen or adolescents? And for some people, their face turns up, you know, or they say loud, you know, rambunctious, disruptive. But you all love working with teens and you're creating these spaces in person and virtual. So what's it like to bring along your colleagues or other patrons where the young people are occupying the space, right? And what's it like to be welcoming to disadvantaged by um, because they're minoritized or because of their low income, even in those communities where we know that there is a relatively racially homogenous community, there is income diversity and lower income children often have less resources. So what's it like to make sure they feel included in these spaces? Tammy, could you speak to that? And then if you wouldn't mind passing that on to Aurora, if you have an answer for how do you help other people understand that the young people have a voice and a space in the library as well? Uh, well, for us, the um, actual, they can't, they can't miss it because it is the focus of our library. So you walk in and you see this great space and um, we had a lot of problems with most, um, senior citizens about why did the teens have this space? What do they need this for? There was a big uproar because we have a sink. I don't know. Um, so those sorts of things were kind of ridiculous, surprising. But as far as um, making the teens that welcome, I would have to answer that, that the teens do that by example. Um, we have a really active teen advisory board. And so when the library was open, they would um, volunteer to come in during times or they'd actually just be there. But no one entered that space without being welcomed and shown around and um, included. If we we're having programs and people weren't registered, you know, I never had to say, hey, come on over. It's always the teens. They just know this is their space. This is a safe place. Come and, and be welcomed. And I'm not sure if that answers it, but it's one of the things that I miss the most. Uh, about not being in person is seeing the teens do that. It does. And so this will be, we want to make sure that there's time for any questions answers that have come through. So Aurora, if you could answer that question, then we'll just see if Melanie has some questions that have come into the Q&A or any other things that we want to hit in our short lunchtime break together. Anything that you want to um, share, Aurora? I think what works for me is my relationship that I have with my colleagues. Um, my colleague that I work with most directly, Stacy, she gets it, um, and so that's that's a that's a blessing. The administrator that she works for is the one who reached out to me to be there, and and she gets it. But I would say it's 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 relationship, right? So even though I don't work at that library, I have worked with. Um, met a, a few of the guards who work there. And to be honest, you all know what that's about, right? Like the guard is the one who's like, you know, who's who's gonna be on it um, and who is often hyper vigilant. And so because of my relationship, they know, okay, Aurora's here with the kids, right? And so it, a lot of it is just, you know, the word, the phrase street cred comes to mind, right? Like even within my organization, it's about relationships. Um, and so my relationships with the adults um, help make things smooth with the kids. Wonderful, thank you. I'm sorry, Valerie. I was saying the same thing as you, Melanie. We were thinking alike. And so I'm passing the mic back over to Melanie and we will go on from there. Thank you both, Terry, Tammy, and also Aurora. Yes, excellent. Thank you. Uh, and also to you, Valerie, for getting our Q&A kicked off with some great conversation here. We have um, just over 10 minutes left, and we already have some audience questions I want to ask. If we, uh, Julia, you could also come back on camera just in case you want to jump in and answer any of these questions. Um, and for folks who have additional questions, please use our Q&A box to post your questions and hopefully we can get to as many as possible. So my very first question um, for the group is, um, why do teens include 12 year olds? Kind of a, a quick straightforward question. Where's the cutoff and why do you include it uh, at 12 years old? Can 
we um, conceptualize this um, grant program, um, the idea is that it gives a range where sites can choose kind of within that window what what where where their engagement focus will be, and also um, how to make book selections and create programming that's developmentally appropriate. I also think it's intentional. Um, I wasn't around when it was conceptualized. I'm newer to PHC, but in my experience in out of school time, there's there tends to be a void of programs um, for middle school and high school youth. And often if young people aren't engaged with something um, in their pre-adolescent years, they're much less likely to be engaged in it in their teen years. So it's also an opportunity um, while they have that same kind of um, youthful curiosity, lack of inhibition that Aurora mentions, um, pre-adolescent years can be a really important time, especially to explore some of the issues like identity um, and social justice that come up in TRL. Great, thank you. All right, so someone else has a question about how do you get funding for books that teens can keep? Well, I, Julia probably can answer this too, but in terms of the TRL program, it is grant funded. Uh, libraries do apply, they commit to serving diverse audiences to having a civic engagement component, which ties in the humanities, and they can propose a budget. And we make sure that, again, that with that budget, those young people get to keep the books that are selected. Um, so that's where the funding comes from. They can use some of that funding to purchase the books and the supplies that not just occur virtually or physically, but that go home with them. And, and that also includes, you know, if there's a need to have some technology involved. So that's where the funding comes from. That comes from the Pennsylvania Humanities Council. And we get funding for our TRL program from the Office of Commonwealth Libraries, from the NEH, and also some individual donors. Um, and like Valerie said, I think especially during virtual programming, it also is giving sites um, an opportunity to reallocate some of their budget items so that students are getting supplies in their homes or so that there are the technology platforms that they need to be able to have access um, from where they are. Thank you. We have another question about how to get started during this trying time where in many communities, teens are doing everything virtually. Uh, the Zoom fatigue is real, right? So how do you get started with that? <laughs> oh, you wanted to, well, I've unmuted, so now I might as well speak. <laughs> So um, my colleague, the way we did it, so we uh, we ran our program, we're in our first set of virtual programming in the summertime. Um, I believe we started in, I believe we started actually in July, which was about when we had intended to, to start. And we advertised via Instagram, advertised via the library's Facebook account, and the young people signed up um, via Google. Uh, via Google Forms. So just to be clear, while we're talking about burnout, um, one of the things I have wanted to mention is that I do eye breaks during my programs now. We do breathing and stretching exercises during our program. Uh, we have break breaks in the program, right? Where we're just like, nope, this is it. The camera's off. Everybody walks away for five minutes. Um, there's one more thing that we do that I feel like is worth sharing. Oh, I send them to breakout rooms to be by themselves, right? To be with one another without me. Right. So just trying to create um, some of the same things that they would have in real life as, as best we can in the virtual plane. OK, great. How do your teens post social media content? Do they have access to library social media channels? Is there a dedicated group? How is that handled? I'll take that um, because my library is a county agency and so we have um, a lot of restrictions as far as what um, formats we can use we do have a facebook account but that's not where the teens are so i post things on facebook about programs and availabilities and parents will share that with their teens but we do have an instagram account that um, i do manage but it's they'll create things and send them to me and then i post it on there and they're taking a lot more um, 
ownership of that. And so it's not like necessarily a library page, but it's more of a team page with their memes and ways that they communicate. Thank you. Do you have tips for where to look for a facilitator? What skills or connections are you looking for? We actually did some work with um, CLP, Carnegie Mellon Libraries, where we just asked them to take a look at our facilitator description a few years back and we updated it. And so we try to, we try, we teachers, teachers are great. We have quite a few libraries that use teachers, community-based artists. Um, and or talked about those who are involved in the mural arts project in Philadelphia. So artists in the community, teachers at schools that you may partner with and who often send their children there, um, word of mouth, those tend to have been most successful because they usually have a pulse, particularly artists, they have a pulse on the community and they also have ways to envision how to bring the humanities alive. I also would note that those partnerships tend to rely more on the librarian for some of the structure because they are really focused on the art, but certainly, um, as Aurora said, there's a tag team involved in that, but those are some spaces, and in our case, we do have a description for, uh, for TRL, there's a description for the leader, and I know that Julia mentioned that, that the TRL guide the TRL guide talks about the nuts and bolts of TRL. It's available on the Pennsylvania Humanities website, and it talks about what to look for in a facilitator. Thanks, Valerie. Well, I think we have time for one more question. So I'm going to ask uh, this one. What is an important piece of advice you would offer to a new facilitator, such as this person who asked the question? <laughs> Flexibility is key. You need to, it needs, you need to leave room to, for it to be all about them, right? So you need to be prepared with things to share and offer and engage with. Um, but there needs to be space for them to guide the conversation and room for things to just shift um, and change and, and pivot as needed. Because the more it's about them and what they want and the more they feel seen, um, the easier it's actually gonna be for all of you and the more enjoyable it will be for all of you. Thanks. And actually, there's one more quick question about where can folks find uh, the grant that was mentioned earlier? And I don't know if this is just in the state of Pennsylvania or if um, this is overall. The, the TRL grant that we provide um, is the two to partners in our state. Um, and we're, and I don't, we're not currently looking for library part. We don't have an application currently open. However, there are humanities councils in every state and similar programs um, may be taking place. Um, and our guide is available if you're looking to start something similar. I also want to mention just speaking to Aurora, the question Aurora answered, and I know we're at the run out of time. Um, is that one component of TRL that we didn't talk about was our community of practice. And one piece of advice I would give to new facilitators is to find a space to practice and have support in kind of the unlearning and learning that comes with being a facilitator of young people. Um, and so we do that monthly in meetings with our facilitators and our partners. Um, and with support from the Office of Com our partners at the Office of Commonwealth Libraries, um, just to practice and study um, a lot of the same quest big questions that we ask young people to think about around identity and Keynes and the humanities. All right, thank you. Any last thoughts that our presenters here would like to leave us with as we prepare to close out? I think I just want to share that as a developmental psychologist, I do want to emphasize that we really do, TRL was revamped based on some evaluation work and what we know about teenagers. We really have designed the guide and the program so that teens can become the leaders that they are, that they have voice, and that there is that built-in flexibility. So when we're working with younger children, it's very scripted, it's very structured. 
that doesn't work with teenagers. Any of us who remember being teens or have teens at home, that doesn't work. So you do have to be prepared. You do have, an, have to have an idea of what you want to do, but also appreciate that they may throw that out and come up with something else. And when they come up with something else, most likely they're gonna stick with it and you are on the right track to building a sustainable relationship with teenagers. I see nodding heads. Any other last comments, Aurora? No, just thank you very much for um, letting us talk about TRL because this program could have been probably 12 hours. We've had so many wonderful experiences and we love to share them. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Take good care of yourself so that you can show up well for others. Indeed. Well, this is wonderful. A huge thank you to Valerie, Tammy, Aurora, and Julia for this excellent discussion. And of course, my colleagues at ALA behind the scenes, Sarah Ostman, Samantha Oakley, Hannah Arata, and BB Brown for their support of this webinar. This presentation has been offered as part of the Programming Librarian's free online learning with support from an NEH CARES grant. The archived version of this session will be available to view on programminglibrarian.org within 48 hours. We will also share with you a resources document prepared by the Pennsylvania Humanities Council. So thank you again to our presenters and thank you to all of you who joined us today. This was a wonderful conversation. And as a parent of a teen, I can say that this work is essential and thank you for all that you're doing to serve our youth. Have a great afternoon, everyone.